Hi friends, I'd like to evaluate human history under the paradigm of free energy, so so-called quote-unquote free energy. Now I mean this in the physics sense where there's a surplus of energy within a system, not in a uh, Joe Cell kind of paraphysics magical energy source kind of way. Anyway, so I'm talking about it as when you have it in a system and there's free energy, then things things happen. It's disruptive. So, for example, in my aquarium, I've got a a crayfish, and I made a little cave for him. He's always just sits in that cave all day long. He sits in that cave. He moves around within that cave a little bit. Um, he'll reach a little bit out to grab some foods and stuff. But basically, because the of the equilibrium of the system, he's in a, a state of of there being very, very predictable and small introductions of free energy into the system, namely the inclusion of food into the environment. If I were to remove the top rock from that cave and rearrange the aquarium, it would disrupt him for days or even longer as he d settled into a new, a new place that was satisfactory for him. It, might it would take him less time if I rebuilt the cave in the same spot, presumably. But the thing is, if you think about him attentionally, he's anticipating that things are going to remain as they've been. That his experience, the longer he continues to have it, the more confidence presumably he has that it will continue to persist. So that's why it takes him a little while to settle into a new spot after I rearrange the tank. Because he needs probably to feel confident that it's not going to be moved again, in some sense. And he needs to feel confident that the thing he's experienced, he's experienced it enough times to recognize that yes, it's reliable. So it's a very SI frame of reference for for Lilu and this understanding of the of the fish tank, right? So now let's look at how this basic system works with human beings and societies. The thing about humans is unlike Lilu, the crayfish, we don't settle very comfortably into a state of equilibrium, and it's because we're inner energy generators <clears throat> and we have a communicative or metaphysical half as well. So our free energy often expresses as as behaviors called talking you know it, but it could also express as varying behaviors that don't seem to link directly to our sustenance Lilu's concerns are exclusively of his sustenance he as long as he is getting food when he needs to and wants to and everything being provided for him and he can just sit in that cave he'll just sit in there indefinitely now presumably if I were to introduce a a female or a male, I don't know what gender my crayfish is, but uh, into the system, that would introduce free energy and it would cause him to behave differently, right? You, In other words, agents account for free energy in some fashion or another. It doesn't just dissipate, it goes somewhere. So, um, then let's look at society and human beings now. And you see these shorthands here uh, for total hours, sustenance hours. Sustenance hours refers to the amount of hours you have to put into just sustaining yourself as a biological being. That is to uh, the amount of hours of sleep you're going to have to get, the amount of time you have spent eating food, the amount of time you have spent acquiring food or working to acquire food, shelter, clothing, basic necessities. Okay, that's sustenance hours. So historically, individuals have had low free energy hours, which is to say very high sustenance hours and high stakes choices. And we can determine that what, what counts as a stakes, so to speak, is choice expressed in allocation of future free energy hours. So if I make a decision to be a homesteader and take my wife out to Nebraska to, to homestead a piece of land or something and build a farm there and make a, make a life for myself, that's a very high stakes choice. I'm committing all of my free energy hours from that point forward to making this work until it gets rolling well enough that I actually have some more free energy hours, right? It's a very high stakes choice. So, um, and historically that's how it expressed for individuals. However, for societies, it was low free energy hours and low stakes choices. That is to say societies as a whole, the group, the group wealth or energy or effort didn't, um, didn't have a lot of surplus either. It was busy doing things like, uh, repairing, the road from from another natural natural calamity of some sort you know things things that were the the infrastructure matters of society required a greater percentage of of society's attention in the olden days than they do now uh, or, or that the, then they had then they did later let's say okay so 
they also had low stakes choices, which is to say, things change slowly. If if a ruler made a bad decision, he might encounter the bad effects of that way down the line, months down the line. Let's say he sends off his army to go fight in France. Well, it takes them a couple months to get there. It takes them a couple months to get back, or and then they find out what happened, and then the other kingdom moves. And so it's like everything, <clears throat> to the extent that future, the 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 commitment of future free energy hours is is determined. It's um, it's delayed. 20th century individuals have high comparatively high free energy hours and low stakes choices compared to any point in previous in history which is to say all of a sudden in the 20th century approximately leisure time came to be a thing um, especially post World War II so let's let's prioritize this 20th century post World War II and so individuals suddenly have high free energy hours and they've got low stakes choices which allows for the sort of consumer uh, culture to to grow, right? Societies can currently have high frequency, I mean, high free, free energy hours, which is to say they can have a lot of resources to devote towards things that might be common goods, like national parks and uh, highways and things like that. And they can currently have uh, high stakes choices. So you've got World War One, World War Two. Do we drop the nukes on, on Hiroshima is a very high stakes choice, right? in the sense that it guarantees it commits tons of uh, free energy hours in the future for the society so america then by doing that was saying okay we're going to go in there and and oversee a transition from an, a warlike imperial japan to a, a democratic peaceful japan that's a, a big commitment in high in um, in free energy hours right so now let's talk about post-digital. In the post-digital age where we are now, individuals have high free energy hours, which is to say, to get the very minimum of sustenance, most people in most Western democracies anyway, don't really have to do a whole hell of a lot. Um, depending, if, if they make their choice accordingly, if they decide to live in a way that requires them to do as little as possible and still survive and move someplace that has a very low cost of living and uh, are very frugal, and do sort of freelance jobs and stuff, um, they can get by, right? It's not going to be much of a life, and maybe they're going to eventually get sick of not having what everybody else has and stuff, but it's conceivable to get by. There are also various systems by various governments. You could go that approach and move to some state that's got a lot of social programs and try to get by that way, or, you know, um, there are, are ways that individuals can determine the amount of free energy hours they have in the post-digital age. And by and large, there seems to be a problem. Problems erupt when people have too many free energy hours. But having a metaphysical ecosystem like the internet helps to mo modify that somewhat, okay? So there's also individuals having low stakes choices. So now so, some place like, this is where NI comes in, right? NISE, some channel like the Tekkit realm, which exploded like did a lot of pre-work kind of understanding first what makes youtube channels blow up and then did those things and it was one of the fastest growing youtube channels in history it got to a thousand subscribers in the first day it it's well over a million now so that's an example of somebody successfully successfully making high stakes choices but the thing is, most people, when they start a YouTube channel, they're making a very low stakes choice because most people will make a video or two and that's it. And to the extent they stick with it, they're still not making a high stakes choice. I could make a video today or not. I, you know, it's like, it's only when, when they become, when the income from successfully making a big YouTube channel becomes committed to future things and other things that then you become locked into your fr your free energy hours, right? So by and large though, people have low stakes choices and they have high amount of free hours comparatively to previously in history. And also I'd point out that food is like, the, the amount of money that food costs in adjusted dollars is way cheaper than it's ever been before. Always historically, people have had to put much more of their energy into, uh, into food acquisition one way or the other. Now, societies in a post-digital age, we're looking at low free energy hours, which is to say 
now because of the the fluidity of information, there are constant demands being placed upon society to meet certain criteria, solve certain problems, meet certain needs, whatever. Um, and there are not excess resources for them. There's not a surplus of of governmental energies and or societal energies to um, to direct towards things really. Uh, in consequence, and as in, in contrast to individuals, though, society is making very high stakes choices. So it's like if you look at COVID, because of the fluidity of information, single choices like um, how am I going to talk about this COVID thing as president that like Trump made, right? Or as any other world leader, it doesn't have to be Trump. How am I going to talk about this? Am I going to talk about this in a way that's responsible and and helps people approach the matter from the right narrative perspective since there's a few voices at the beginning of something like that that are very loud and there was in this instance a concerted effort to sort of exclude exclude voices that didn't agree with the, the scientists on the matter but because people didn't prioritize what should come before those questions of, of utility and, and what the scientists say which is what are the proper roles of government individuals what is the proper role? What is the proper approach to risk management? How much responsibility do individuals have to prevent potential risks, and under what circumstances? Those those issues all needed to be discussed, and none of them were. And also, how do we justify things? There was so much appeal to ignorance being done at the beginning of the COVID thing. Since we don't know, we have to overreact. Was basically the gist of it. And and those kind of things are are important narratives, right? So it's like having that conversation at the beginning about how this violates precedent we've already set regarding how we deal with potential risk management and also how this violates proportionality with previous examples of how we deal with things even if you even if you allow for this to be substantially more it's not that much more in terms of harms so uh you know it's like uh there's a lack of proportionality in our response and now here we have in los angeles where we're still all wearing masks and nobody everybody just sort of like slump shoulders just deals with it and strangely it's like i haven't seen any any activism or advocacy against it i i need to make and get a shirt that says wearing this mask is degrading and have a picture of a mask and i still have to wear the mask but it, at least at least I'll be saying something, right? The point is, I'm an individual with, frankly, low stakes choices. So I might might make that shirt. I might make it on Redbubble and get it. And I might wear it. And it's still a low stakes choice. The most I'm going to incur is an argument with somebody who disagrees with me. Uh, whereas, let's say I'm in the Middle East and I'm a free thinking young woman in Afghanistan and want to walk around with my atheist shirt on. Well that's a high stakes choice you're going to lose all your free energy hours because you're going to be kidnapped and killed by insane fanatics so that's that's this thing and remember when I'm talking about societies I'm really meaning like America but you can include Western Europe in there too yes I'm a little Eurocentric I'm sorry it's just who why why wouldn't you be centric to what we're, what your culture is in some sense, right? It's, it's kind of natural. But I try to be objective about everything. But that's part of my culture too, I guess. So anyway, thanks for watching and enjoy your free energy hours. Don't spend too many of them fapping because this is no nut November apparently. Not that I'm adhering to that, but if you are.